What up, Whiskey Ginger fans? Welcome back to the show. I got a good one for you today. It's Mr. Adam Carolla. Uh, I've been a fan of Adam's for a long time, many, many years. I grew up on him on TV and radio and podcasting. Uh, I'm excited to sit down with the dude. Very funny, very interesting Los, Los Angeles native. Um, I'm going to be back on the road finally, but we're going to do it in April. April, I'm going to be at uh, Salt Lake City at uh, Wise Guys, and then Addison, uh, a.k.a. Dallas, Texas, at the end of April as well. We're putting updates at andrewsantino.com, so look out for those. Uh, you want to grab some merch if you're on YouTube, look down below. There's a merch bar, or go to andrewsantinostore.com. Either way, that's where all the hats and the shirts and the glasses and all that good jazz are at. Uh, and also, if you're on YouTube, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when we post. And we post every single Friday. We don't miss, baby. We don't miss. Uh, if you're looking for more content like this, by the way, I do uh, solo um, Cheeto chats. I do uh, Zooms with top tiers where we can interact one-on-one -on -one and all that stuff at the Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash whiskeygingerpodcast. Patreon.com slash whiskeygingerpodcast where you can get that extra bonus content. And I'm working on a bunch of new stuff over there, so it's going to be fun. Enough rambling from me. Let's go to the episode. In here, we pour whiskey, 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 whiskey. Creature in the ginger beard. Sturdy and ginger. Like vampires, the ginger gene is a curse. Gingers are beautiful. You owe me five dollars for the whiskey and seventy-five dollars for the horse. Gingers are oh, hell no. This whiskey is excellent. Ginger, I like gingers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Whiskey Ginger. My guest today is one of my favorite people on earth. I say that for all my guests, but I mean it once again today. It's Adam Carolla. Adam. What's Thank up? you, man. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks Cheers. for coming. Thanks for a having something, me. Something. You're like the only person that's drank on the show in like six weeks. Nobody drinks anymore. I thought the whole deal with COVID is we're allowed to drink during the you day. You can. Yeah, you're allowed to drink during the day. Yeah. First thing in the morning. I like to have eggs and whiskey, then do a little jog, and then uh, whiskey again in the afternoon. Yeah. It's good for you. Uh, you know... I work with Dr. Drew so many years that I probably can't say it's good for you. Sure. But uh, I think some people are able to have a relationship with it that doesn't affect their life yeah. in a detrimental way as much as others. Well, what it, well, like, look, you've been in comedy for how many years? How, how long have you, have you been in? 25. In the world? Yeah. 25 plus now. And how many of your friends got sober over the 25 years, comic wise? Uh, none. But I, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> But not but, a one. Well, yeah, I have to understand, like, I didn't come up with comics in like right. a traditional sense. Right. I came up with improvisational people, groundling people, acne comedy, acne comedy people, and then radio people. So right. I came up through radio. Right. You did, but I mean, you've embedded yourself in the comedy world. So you're friends with so many comics that are both sketch or improv or stand ups. I'm surprised because I would say half of my friends got sober. Like over the years, and and not just in the world of stand up, just like comedic actors or sketch people or whatever. I think people have just started to get sober, and I'm like alone on this island drinking again. Well, you now have company, my friend. Yeah, thank you very much. You're I appreciate welcome. it. I know. I hate the only thing, you know, the whole thing about day drinking is it's awesome unless you have some judgmental prick sitting next to you. Yeah. There, there's nothing worse than the airplane drinking because. I become, when I get on a flight, I essentially become Otis from Mayberry. It's right. like I become a full-fledged <laughs> alcoholic. Same, when I, I, when I get on a flight, I go from decent drinker to just, uh, a, a, you know, Andy Cap. Right. Uh, um, I, I'm, I just become an insane drinker on flight because the whole flight experience is so depressing to yeah. me that I need something to take the edge off. And... I don't give a good shit if it's 6.45 in the morning. Yeah. I'm getting the cocktails. But there's nothing worse than the person next to you that orders the Diet Fresca but mm -hmm. wants to know, it, it, does it have caffeine? And I'm like, <laughs> can I have three of those little <laughs> bottles of Tito's yeah. if he's not going to have his? Yeah. Yeah. Give it to me. Do you drink before you get on the plane? See, I like to have something right before I get on. I like the before, during, middle... And right as you land in Kansas City, yeah, yeah. Well, the key for the for the plane drinking is you have to cut yourself off at some point because most of the flying I do is going against the time zone, 
And so it means when I, so the, if I'm doing two shows in Florida, yeah. in Naples on a Friday night, I leave Friday morning and it's a 6 a.m. flight out of LAX. Yeah, me too. At some point, if you don't cut yourself off, like somewhere over, you know, toward the end of Texas, you're going to be shit when you get up on stage it's for true. the second show that night. So I Which will, I've done, by the way. Oh, yeah. Too we've many all, times. We've all done that. So uh, I will cut myself off Yeah, you, te you temper it. You mm -hmm. said before we started the show that you lived near this neighborhood. Obviously, we're not going to uh, reveal where we are. But you grew up in the valley, and you still live in the valley or no? Did you move? I moved. You're too good to, for us now? I, yeah, I'm in uh, La Cunada, California, which is kind of, you know, Beverly Hills Valley. Yeah. But uh, yes, from, from where we're sitting, I grew up uh, two streets over, and I, I passed by this building on my way to school. Wow. I walked every every every, every day. I would just walk right past this. Are you, were you... I'm, I'm always interested in people that are from LA like there's a, a handful of my friends that were born and raised like I started comedy in LA which oh, everyone was always like why in, you know because most people want to start in their little hometown and I wanted to drown if I got here I was like I'm just going to sink or I'll float there will be no like middle at home I know you I could have just kind of gone, you know done this thing where it's like oh it could have been okay but I had the safety net but being from LA and starting out here your career in TV and radio and everything did you feel like it was easier or more daunting than because did you have any connections? No, I grew up in North Hollywood, but it it was a you know million miles away from Hollywood. It's right. North Hollywood. It's yeah. very kind of blue collar. Um, I didn't grow up with any connections other than when you do grow up around here. Every blue moon, you go into the Gelsons and you go, "Oh, that's Robert Urich." Robert Urich is getting fresh squeezed orange juice. Whoa. Oh my God. So it's like a little bit of spot that person right. or a little bit of some friend's dad is, is grandpa Al from the Munsters, you know, it's just weird <laughs> right. shit like that, right. but it doesn't get you any closer to show business. You just right. happen to be aware of it. Um, so I, 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 I didn't really have any aspirations of, of show business or, or comedy or anything. I was kind of a jock. And then I got kind of blue collar. And then I was like a carpenter for a lot of years. And it, it wasn't something that I kind of grew up with. And none of my friends grew up with it. There wasn't any, any plan. But at a certain point, I was actually had this idea to do the opposite of what you were just suggesting, which is... At some point, I was like, L.A. is too big for me, and L.A. is kind of the market you end up at, mm -hmm. but I need to go into a small market and kind of, you know, get, get my bones, wet. you know, make my bones. So I was like, I had this plan of I'm going to move to, like, San Francisco, and I'm going to do stand-up, and I'm going to find some little local club, and, right. and, and that's going to be my home club, and it's going to you know, I'm going to, going to work out, I'm going to get better. And then I'm going to come back to LA. It, it never worked. It didn't work at all. It was horrible. <laughs> it was like the worst time in my life. But, um, why do you, why, why did it fail so bad? Do you think up there? I had this like romantic notion that the reason I wasn't funny or the reason I wasn't achieving what I wanted to achieve is that is because I was in this, this big, market right. and 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 that that i started off in the place that people were supposed to arrive at as their final destination so if i went somewhere else that was smaller i could really get stage time yeah and and i could learn and i wouldn't be competing with all these seasoned veterans and things like that and it's it's it, it's like when people say you know i'm gonna move to a new town and change my life but you just pack yourself and right. all your bad habits and inclinations to the new town. Right. And What's that pick phrase? Pick up where you where, left wherever off. Wherever you go, there you are. It's like that old, you know, cliche. Yeah. It's, it's like, like you can't escape anything. It's going to be you forever. It, yeah. It's like when some species gets out of its indigenous area in South America and ends up in Florida. Right. They don't just start taking on 
the traits of the nice species that are there. They just start eating them right. and doing what and fucking. Right, right. And they become mm. nutria. Right. So that's essentially what everyone does when they move. But there's a na- naivete that thought, oh, I could move to San Francisco and learn my trade. Well, and then and now, and then look, you've had not to kiss the ring, but you've had a super long, successful career. And I was a fan before I ever got into stand up. I mean, before I knew I wanted to get into stand up. And for me, you know, like, when you guys had the man show, you know, I know that was a long time ago for you in terms of you've done so much more after that, but I loved the man show because I was like, this is just an, I just felt like it was an honest expression of just a bunch of people cracking legit jokes that anybody I knew was making and on TV for the first time. Because I feel like nobody was, nobody was kind of talking that kind of shit on TV ever. It didn't really exist yet in that realm, you know? I and mean, if it did, it was much more watered down. Yeah, we, you know, the man show, and I, I think sometimes people have a, it, there's a little misnomer that it's like me and Jimmy slapping chicks on the ass and drinking beer, and that was the man show. Right. We really just wanted to do a show together, and we wanted to do a show that was funny, that sort of our version of funny. Yeah. So, and the way Hollywood works is you, you have to kind of declare a major, you know, yeah. what kind of show is it? And you can't just go, me and this funny dude want to do what's funny to us. Mm-hmm. That's not really, they they need a label. Yeah. So we came up with the man show, but it was essentially just an excuse for us to hire all our friends, hire people we wanted to work with, and just sit down and do what we wanted to do comedically. Yeah. I mean, it was great. I mean, I just think like, could you sell that show today? Um, or could you remake it today? Like, would you do it? If they said we want you to redo the show again, would you do it? Uh, I, I always think that stuff's a little sad when you kind of go, go back, back and revisit, like, you know, when they do, it's like a very Brady Christmas 1999 <laughs> yeah. and right. everyone's old and fat right. and Alice is dead and it's like... It's On just, heroin. Yeah, and, yeah. It, it, seems, uh, it seems a little thirsty, you yeah. know? Um, so probably not. You know, Jimmy and I did a hundred episodes and when we were done with the hundred episodes it was like yeah that's you were done that's what we wanted to do are you guys still close at all or no yeah you are yes he's a jimmy's one of the most generous like sort of authentic shouldn't have said sort of (laughs) (laughs) he's kind of he's he's kind of sort of medium authentic right he's super genuine he's super authentic and he's the most thoughtful guy you'll ever meet and i'm one of the least thoughtful guys well, he, you'll ever he, want to meet. he's a really uh, look he's he barely knows me but does but has been really nice to me over the years and also like i kind of learned what kind of guy he was when i met his uncle frank uh oh you know he uncle passed frank it. well this is a, this is an insane story and i and i always had said i wish i could you know tell it to jimmy because jimmy doesn't i've never had the time to sit and talk to him like that but I, my first gig in Southern California when I moved here, at the time, a good girlfriend of mine who I had worked my little day job with, her dad was the mayor of Hawthorne. And he, he was running the San Gennaro Festival. Oh, okay. And he says to, to his daughter, he says, oh, we're looking for like more entertainment or whatever. And she goes, there's this like young comedian guy that's at my office. I was at this little shitty desk job. And he goes, well, tell him I'll give him 100 bucks. And I was like, 100 bucks? Holy fuck. I mean, what, am I going to buy a house after this? So I go down there, and I write a bunch of material that I think could work for families. He's like, keep it clean. And I ate such a big bag of shit. I mean, it was so... It was the worst I've ever bombed ever, 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 times a 1,000, just because I also was writing material for them and not that I... You know, it was like I was custom making shit that wasn't even mine. Yeah, you know, it's like for try- the San Gennaro fee. Yeah, and, and yeah. here I am, you know, it's, I'm trying to make pizza and I don't make pizza. Do you know what I mean? I was like, this is... Of course, they know it's bullshit. Yeah, it's a tough crap. I bombed. I ate shit. And then afterwards, Frank, Uncle Frank, who now is rest in peace, is not with us, came up to me and was like... Could tell I was just sulking in the corner, embarrassed. And he was like, oh, you're going to be funny. You have all the makings of being funny. You're just you're just not there yet at all. He's like, you've got it. You just don't know how to cook it together yet. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, I appreciate it. And he said, you, do you know Jimmy Kimmel? I said, yeah, I know Jimmy Kimmel. He goes, do you want to meet him? I said, yeah, I would love to meet him. He said, come tomorrow to the taping and give your name to the door and bring your nice little girl here with you and uh, go to the side and they'll let you in. Thank you, yada. And I'm thinking, 
yeah, fucking right. You know, that's, this is not a real... Sure enough, I go to Hollywood Boulevard. I go anyway. And I tell the security guard on the side, I said, you Frank, Uncle Frank said, you know, to come. I said my name. And sure enough, Frank comes running out. When people are in line, you know, when people are in line to see the show, he comes running out and gets me, a kid who doesn't know, and my girlfriend at the time, and takes us in and meets Jimmy. And then we sit and just talk in the green room. And I was like, oh, that's the kind of people that they are. And Jimmy was so cool about it that I... It just it meant a lot to me, especially being a young comic, because I had I had loved Jimmy already. I, I didn't know him. And it was a huge thing for me for a guy who was trying to come up in the thing that gave me a little bit of, oh, not everyone in Hollywood is a fucking asshole. Yeah. Frank was is was uh, like insanely authentic. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. he just whatever he thought, whatever he was saying, that's exactly what he thought. Right. He was uh, I, I mean, of course, I met uncle frank and hung out with uncle frank a million times because when you when you meet jimmy you immediately sort of get married to his family right you have his dad jim and joan his mom and jill his sister and john his brother and then all the nephews and the nieces and the the aunts and the uncles and the aunt chippies and the uncle franks and they all just immediately become a part of your life and I come from this weird, sparse, kind of cold, anti-family family. So I had no, I was like closer with Jimmy's parents than I am with my parents. Right. And, and, and so I kind of liked being in, included in this, this group of this super thick as thieves family, which is Jimmy. And then of course, you know, as soon as Jimmy got his show but as soon as we did uh the man show it was like here's my cousin sal he's coming out here here's uncle frank you know here's aunt chippy like it's just just, they all just showed up yeah and became a part of this culture which is so wild it's like now they're embedded in the comedy culture forever because of that it just kind of became yeah america's tv family sort of like the fact that like cousin sal became like this fixture in the same way like stern does that a little bit too with his family and friends of they just become a part of the world and I, like as your your parents were still together or do, were you a divorced kid i'm a divorced kid good for you saying yeah who is i know my i don't know who isn't it's anymore. weird it is weird um my parents got divorced you know when i was i don't know eight or nine but they didn't get divorced they just split because there was no reason <laughs> stop like, showing up well divorce was like too highfalutin for them like that right. would have cost 80 bucks or something they had <laughs> nothing to whack up they had no property right. they had n- they didn't possess anything um as far as like you know the kids went and all that they didn't really care about that they didn't, didn't have anything so there's like why go through the motions of getting divorced when there's no legal reason it is we'll just move apart and they did that for like a decade so they were technically still married for your youth but then they just weren't together that's all it was yeah they wouldn't talk to each other couldn't see each other my theory was always that they were both embarrassed to have been with each other (laughs) just like yeah they were both there's a lot of shame with their past they don't want to face it again yeah just walk away from it forever yeah when you say that you grew up were you an apartment kid you grew up in an apartment your whole life so i grew up literally 300 yards from where we're sitting in a one bedroom one bathroom house so i grew up in a house for the most part but but the caveat is the house i grew up in was my grandmother's second kind of junker house that she bought for a rental property for ten thousand dollars in like 1951 god literally ten thousand dollars now it's worth three million and well not well the thing that's crazy about california real estate that that uh people who aren't from around here will probably have fun digesting which is so we lived in this broken down junker house for, and basically my grandmother was sort of like, well, I ruined my daughter, so I'll just let her flop at this house and (laughs) get welfare checks and food stamps and she can just live rent free. But she wasn't gonna fix up the house or put any money into the house because she wasn't getting any return on her investment. So we grew up in that house until my uh and the house like 100 years old had no 
heat or air or anything. And my dad moved out. Eventually, he moved into an apartment. And so then I became sort of half apartment, uh, half house guy. But the house was such a pile of shit that the apartment seemed cool to me. Like when I'd go right. to my friend's apartments, I was like, hey, not too shabby. You got carpet that goes all the way to the wall. And <laughs> it was like a big deal because my house was so bad. And, and the house is so bad that it's sold about six years ago for like six hundred and eighty thousand dollars and was completely bulldozed right it was a tear down took it they didn't even leave up like one wall they just completely bulldozed the place and built a new house (laughs) so that's that's how bad it was yeah because honestly it's probably worth if if it was held up at all it had to been worth way more than that right if they did anything to it that was worth it, it just was in yeah, shambles. It was just a old, weird old, literally house from like turn of the century. Like it yeah. was one of the first valley houses, probably. Well, that was the thing that, like, honestly, I moved to the valley a couple of years ago and I was always had this weird because an out of towner, you probably have heard this, you know, like a guy that's not from here. We don't understand the valley. We don't, it can't wrap our heads around it. It doesn't mean anything to us. You, you live over on the other side of the hill because that's where all the shit is. And then when I came over here, it reminded me so much of Chicago uh, that I was like, oh, this is just like the, the outskirts of Chicago. It had this exact same vibe, the same kind of feel. The neighborhood designs were similar. So many of the streets near me are Chicagoland streets. Which it just has this Midwest vibe to it. Because as a kid, I, I've said this on the show before, I was always mesmerized by when I would watch a movie. I was like, that's my neighborhood. That looks exactly like my neighborhood. And they're all, it's all shot up here, Burbank and all that stuff. But it was almost reflective of anywhere USA, except with us, the houses always have a pattern. What blows my mind in California is there's no consistency whatsoever. Like the, the, the style, there's a few that have like similar things in the Valley of designers. You could tell architects that came through, but one house next to the other could have z- zero in common, like absolute opposite types of houses. And it's like that throughout the neighborhood where at least in the Midwest, everything kind of feels the same. So it's like everything here feels like a prop house almost or like a set house, you know? Yeah. I mean, we, again, I, I live in a house that was like literally built in like 1882. Yeah. And then there'd be a 70s house to the right, right, 70s house to the left, and then, you know, ranch house like up the street. Like it was catch as catch can. And that's why it was, it was kind of weird because the neighborhood was pretty decent. And was it safe? Was there any like? Was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was safe. It was. It was normal. Uh, hence the six hundred and eighty grand to bulldoze it right, kind right. of neighborhood. <laughs> so the thing that was funny is, is you'd be driving through the neighborhood, and you know, two streets over were these big sprawling ranch houses yeah. with white picket fences and freshly you know, groomed lawns and everything. So when people would be like driving me home from like Pop Warner football practice, they'd be going, hey, somebody's arrived, you know, like looking good. Like, cause in other parts of the country, once you got into the nice neighborhood, you're in the nice neighborhood. Sure. And then they'd pull up to this ramshackle <laughs> shotgun shack with the brown lawn and the roof falling off. And it'd always be like, oh, oh. you live there. <laughs> like, you're like, no, it's behind it. There's you, This is the front. It's a flag lot. You can't see it from here. Jesus. It's yeah. the mansion in the back. Um, I ha- I've been on your show one time. Uh, I'm going to come do it again, by the way. I'm curious to know Please. if you... Look, you're so good at this thing, right? You're so good now at whatever it is, whether it's podcasting or interviewing or whatever whatever, whatever people want to call it now because it's taken on so many different forms. If if you're given the opportunity to do a show on TV, do you take it or do you, are you so set in this world now that you're doing your own thing and you don't want to go back to that? I'm always uh, open to entertain, you know, any ideas or offers yeah. or possibilities. In general, um, as we tape this, um, today, I'm at right after this, I'm doing my 3,000th show. Congrats. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, right? So I'm probably two, two weeks away or a week and a half away from my 12th year of doing this. So you get kind of used to being independent and not having sort of corporate boards and right. overlords and saying what you want, not having to worry, especially in the weird cancel culture and everything we're at. So, um, you know, I don't think 
I, I never really had any hard, fast rules about here's what I do and here's what I don't do. Sure. The deal is, is I would do anything if they kind of gave me some autonomy and let me do what I wanted to do. Or I wouldn't, depending on what the rules were, you know, but I, I never right. really had rules. Like, well, does that does that come into play? Like what you said, like a, getting the cancel culture now of like making its way into the podcast space or the or digital entertainment space because you're indie and you have so much freedom, right? Like because we're independent shows, do you think that that's kind of what keeps you there too is like, you know, like Rogan is a, is a buddy and going over to Spotify was a whole ordeal. You know, they, they, the Spotify people, they threw their arms up and wanted him to take down episodes with certain people that he had had on the show. And that became this whole debate. And of course they lost because right. they gave the guy a hundred million dollars. So right. it's just kind of like, do you feel like that's keeping you there more to get away from all the ideas of people coming at you for no reason? Or does that have no bearing on it at all? I am um, very simple and, and maybe a little naive in the sense that, you know, people always say, well, you make documentaries or you make films sometimes or you write books or you do a podcast or you do some TV shows. So what is it you want to do or you like to do? And my thing is like, I want to take my ideas. I want to put them in your head. And mm. that's about it. Or stand up or whatever. Sure. It's just like, hey, here's my idea. Let me convey my idea to you. Right. And sometimes it's via a book. Sometimes it's via stand-up. Sometimes yeah. it's via podcast or, or, or appearing on a show like your own. Yeah. And it doesn't really much matter to me how it's conveyed, you know? So it's sure. sort of like you can shoot heroin, you can smoke heroin, you can snort heroin. Yep. I just want to get the heroin into you. <laughs> That's my, or fentanyl. Like, I just want to poison your yeah, mind. Fentanyl you know? more. So I don't really care. Like, I'm like a Mexican cartel. Like, I don't care if the kids in Nebraska are shooting it, snorting it, licking right. it. As long as they bought breathing it. Breathing it. I just got to move inventory. <laughs> so I'm just looking to get America hooked. No, it's well, I mean, because it's also now, like, the reason that we love it so much as stand-ups is... You know, it's another way to connect with our audience, which means so much to us. Because for years on the road, I mean, how long have you been doing stand up? I I started off doing stand up out of necessity, and when I say necessity, I just mean like when I was like twenty five, I was like, I don't know, there is no Sirius XM or Spotify or podcast sure. or cable or it's just there's sitcoms. I'm not sitcom material. I was like, I was always like, you can't read. You're no good. <laughs> you can't do anything. You don't look right. Like right. you're never going to be a, a mainstream like sitcommy kind of guy. So I just did stand up because there was nothing else to do. Right. And and I did it, and I wasn't any good at it. And it was like I was funny, but I I just wasn't any good at stand up, and I didn't work at it like I should have. And I immediately just kind of went into the Groundlings and Acme Theater and sketch and improv and all that kind of stuff. And I I kind of pecked away at stand up like all the I, I would retry it like every like three years, like maybe I can do this, and it never fit. It just didn't feel right. right. And and so then I then I got into the Man Show and Love Line and syndicated this and you know basic cable that and I, I was so busy and so kind of diversified that doing stand-up would seem like a weird place to go back to sure. for me um and then what happened was I got uh they flipped the format on my morning show when I was out here on Kalis X when I took over for Howard Stern on the west coast and I don't know maybe 10 or 12 markets you know Seattle and Vegas and shit like that and and it all just kind of ended there was like a financial crisis there was no more terrestrial radio yeah i had been getting contracts every year for you know the last 15 years there are no more contracts and i started getting these offers because i was a name that people recognize like hey do you want to come out and do stand-up and i was like well, I don't really do stand up, but I do want to get paid. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I go, yeah, sign me up. Right. And I find myself like showing up with no act. Zero material. Zero material, but with such a sort of crazy strength for improvisation and crowd work yeah. that I could just literally crowd work my way through a, 
an hour or 90 minutes or whatever, you know, yeah. we do, you know, what can Adam complain about? Like someone shouts something out and I'll just do it. So that's, and then as I kept doing that, I was sort of like, well, here's a bit that kind of worked last time I was at Cobbs, Craft you know, maybe it'll one. work over here in right. Seattle. So I started doing that. And then I was just kind of making my way through the country doing well but not really i never called myself a stand-up i was like doing a kind of a one-man show and right. people knew who i was so they could I'd tell a couple of man show stories and you know stuff like that i was kind of faking my way through it and then at a certain point about maybe two or three years ago i was just sort of like well why not be a stand-up like why not um work you know a premise craft it I didn't, my whole thing is my self-esteem was so low, I didn't think it was okay to ever repeat a joke. Right. So I thought you had to come out there and just do something you've never a said before. A new hour every night? <laughs> like 90 minutes, like every night. That's and and I just thought, I, I always had this weird thing in my head, like you can't just... You can't say you just broke up with your girlfriend if you said that nine months ago. <laughs> right. You can't do it. Like, right. it's lying. So I never gave myself that leeway, and I never could really hone material. And then at a certain point, I, I and from watching guys like you and Rogan and guys like that, just sort of understanding that stand-up is its own animal, yeah. and, and, and it's its own art form, and you're allowed to do that. Yeah. That that you could do that. And I gave myself the permission to do it. And now I just do stand up. In here, we pour whiskey. whiskey. Domains, whiskey. blogs, merch, whatever you're selling, whatever you're doing, you guys, squarespace.com is the spot. Uh, turn your beautiful idea into a beautiful real life website. I use Squarespace to create my website. You can check it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's very easy to use. It's very uh, hands-on, very friendly. Has a bunch of beautiful templates that are already pre-set up for you to use. So if you don't know what you're doing, i.e. me, not a smart person, this guy, uh, I could figure it out. You can figure it out, I promise. I've said this before. I love Squarespace. I think it's great. They have award-winning 24-7 customer support. Uh, and they have all these things that can uh, help you set up an easy-to-use website of your own, whether you're selling stuff online or you just want to publish blogs or... You know, you are you're actually uh, trying to push something new out there to the world, and you don't know how to do it. Squarespace.com is the place to go to get that done. Like I said, everything is really easy to use and, and quickly set up for you, and the templates are, are very simple. Uh, the e-commerce functionality lets you sell anything online. Uh, they let you customize the look and the products, the styles. I mean, literally down to everything. Uh, the built-in search engine optimization and free and secure hosting, which is even more important if you're looking for that. Look, if you're trying to build a website, trying to design something, I don't care what it is, Squarespace is genuinely the place that you should go to to start off your website the right way. Uh, go to squarespace.com slash whiskey for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code whiskey to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Again, squarespace.com slash whiskey. Get 10% off the first purchase of a website or domain. I promise you're going to like it. Squarespace.com slash whiskey. Support for Whiskey Ginger is brought to you by Manscaped. Guys, they are the best in men's below the waist grooming. Uh, Manscaped just released their new cologne scent to help you feel good and smell good all over. Look, I got this stuff in the mail and I was skeptical. I was like, what is it going to smell like? Jaquar Noir? Am I going to smell like Curve for Men? Am I going to take it back to high school? Some cool water cologne? No, my friend. You smell significantly better. This is really good stuff. Uh, you know, it really does. It really genuinely does smell good. I was surprised because you never know what you're going to get into. Um, I, uh, I've been using Manscaped for a while now. I've talked to you about it. The Perfect Package 3.0 has uh, all the below the belt grooming needs um it's pretty incredible uh but now you got the the nice good smell and scent the signature scent that's in manscape formula as a cologne is a perfect combination to the collection it's light and approachable yet gentlemanly at the same time uh it's calming and inviting it's very very nice the bottle looks very cool it's sleek it's sexy uh so when you're using the other manscape products uh, like the lawnmower which i use and you don't you don't want to nick your nuts anymore because they got that skin safe technology baby then you want to stink good after you get out of the shower 
whether or not you're going to go see somebody or you're going to sit, sit alone in your room and just watch a movie by yourself, which is also cool. You still want to smell good. Um, it's time to feel sexy, fellas. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WHISKEY20 at manscaped.com. Your body and your balls, of course, are always going to thank you. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code WHISKEY20 at manscaped.com. 20% off. That's pretty good. And free shipping at manscaped.com. Use that code WHISKEY20. Look good, smell good, and feel good with Manscaped. Guys, Bespoke Post has done it again. Bespoke Post, the creators of Box of Awesome, they make an incredible box delivered to your front door with all sorts of very cool stuff, showcase pieces to level up your style inside of your home, cool new threads to wear in the comfy seasons ahead. Uh, Bespoke is very cool, very curated, very specific. You get online, you take a little quiz. Can you take a quiz? Huh? You're not going to fail. It's not high school. It's okay. There are no wrong answers. Uh, Bespoke Post... They send you uh, the best stuff every single month in a box to your front door. And no matter what you're into, Box of Awesome has got you covered. Style and grooming. Um, you know, they have uh, cooking tools. All sorts of, like, very unique, uh, a wide range of very unique things, I should say, actually. Got myself a decanter from them. Some whiskey stuff, which I appreciate. Shout out to Bespoke Post for all that. Um, but get started. Go online. Take that quiz at boxofawesome.com. It's very, very simple. They're going to help you pick the right box of awesome for you. They're going to send it to your door, and it's free to sign up. You don't like it, you can quit, cancel a month, do whatever you got to do. It's definitely worth it. You will enjoy. Free to sign up, and you can skip a month, like I said. It's only 45 bucks for the box, but there's way more than $70 in there, at least, a product. So uh, right now, get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com. Enter the code WHISKEY at checkout as we do. That's boxofawesome.com, code WHISKEY for 20% off your first box. Boxofawesome.com, code WHISKEY. Everybody shopping online, especially now, or shopping more than ever on the intro net, gets stuff delivered to your door. I get it. But are you saving money while you're doing it? Are you wasting it? You throwing it away? You burning it? You flushing down the toilet? Honey, got to use honey. Uh, honey is incredible. It's super easy. It's super simple. Uh, it's a free browser extension. It scours the internet for promo codes, and it simply applies them to what you're shopping for right away in your cart. That's it. It's that easy. You literally have to do almost nothing except for shop online. Honey does the rest for you. When you check out, the Honey button is going to drop down. All you have to do is click Apply Coupons, and you're good to go. I, me, myself, bought a wireless charger for my new iPhone for the bedroom, and uh, Honey button came down. Good to see you, Honey. And clicked on it, saved six bucks. Pretty good. Cup of coffee. Hey, it's free money that I was just going to give to them, but I got back to me because of Honey. Thank you, Honey, for that. I appreciate it. Uh, honey saved me money and uh, pretty good, man. Six bucks is pretty good to save on the first time I ever used it. So shout out to Honey for that. It's found uh, 17 million members, over $2 billion in savings. Be one of those people that has the savings. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. By getting it, you're going to be doing yourself a solid supporting this podcast, which I appreciate. Get Honey. It's free. You got nothing to lose. Uh, get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash whiskey. That's joinhoney.com slash whiskey. Support the pod. Joinhoney.com slash whiskey. Ginger. I like gingers. Now, it's, so it's, it is funny, though, because I've heard this story from many people before, particularly that have had success prior to the stand-up, and then they're getting into stand-up again later in life. It's, it's either revisiting it or, you know, like you're doing. It's kind of like restarting up again, that they're so afraid of being pigeonholed as like, oh, I've... He's just telling that story that he's doing from before. But the truth is, when you structure the right way like that, they don't give a shit either. They want, they would rather have you tell a story again if they've seen you, you know, before at the club a week ago, as long as they see you improving it. They just want to see you keep building on it. You know, it's like passing a, you know, passing a, a high rise they're building. And you just are like, oh, I know they're building that thing. I've seen them build it for three months now, but oh shit, balconies now. Like, I just feel like they, they're that's, it's that same way that they don't really care as much as we think they care as long as you're structurally building. Now, if you're doing the same material verbatim, I mean, that's the number one complaint of any waitress at any club. They're like, I've heard this <laughs> asshole right. do the same jokes for seven years. Right. And that to me is that that's like this weird vague line of like, when is stuff okay to let go? And I don't really know. I mean, I, you know, I'm starting again with all sorts of new shit now. Like I've just started trying, you know, touring again, or I'm going to start touring again. And, uh, fuck, it's a nightmare because I, I had took like a whole year off. I mean, people were doing shows here and there and I kind of tried, but I was shooting this TV show and it was just too exhausting. So now I feel like I'm starting from zero again, which is daunting, but super fucking fun. Like I, it's, it's, that's my favorite is starting over again, even though it's a, a nightmare 
When you said Groundlings, by the way, did you got did you have anybody uh, in your like graduating class that really kind of took off or no? Uh, me. You're the only one. Huh? No, uh, <laughs> just being a douche. No, um, seriously, you could you could be the only one. Um, I think I had uh, Lisa Kudrow was in my my group. Was she good? Yeah, yeah, she was good. She was a completely different person. She had like dark hair. Right. It was like a little bit haunchy. <laughs> like she just had a completely her physicality <laughs> right. was completely different than the Lisa. Then which we know today. Yeah. You know today, but um, and there were you know there were other people you've heard of that were definitely floating around there. It there was no like Will Ferrell. Well, Will Ferrell was like the roommate of my friend uh jerry collins and like he'd go to parties after you know a show or something and they'd be like hey, it's will he's on you know like stuff like that yeah it was all but it was all kind of cousins they weren't really like brothers and sisters sure or, but that whole group if, if someone gave me a roster in the years i could probably figure it out but it wasn't anybody that stood out other than kudrow <laughs> that was that was the one that that popped the most I yeah. mean, it's funny to think, though, because I, I always say, like, that's the one thing you always never know about Hollywood is you're like, you sitting next to in a class like that with someone who you think could be just whatever, and then they're on, you know, one of the biggest sitcoms of all time. And I've had a handful of friends have that happen where you are you literally never know, and you're like, God, I, that fucking guy, he wasn't even good when I met him, and now he became this Well, thing. but if the kids are listening, this is why you have to be nice to everybody or try to bang them <laughs> because then you can go oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> i know you yeah i know the real you yeah she's flying high she wasn't she wasn't flying so high on my futon in 89 <laughs> I'll tell you that right now yeah yeah it is funny to like to see how many people i've seen that i started with that like popped off or people like to me this is interesting for me because the history of like the comedy in the city that comes and goes is like there were guys that i wish didn't quit like, did you ever have someone in your group of friends that you thought was so funny or so talented and they just gave up? Yeah, I mean, I, I always kind of answer it this way where people go, who's the funniest guy you know? And I go, you wouldn't know his name. Right. And that's right. kind of the sad irony of, of this business, which is I think people treat it in a weird way, they treat it like it's the NBA. Like, who's the best basketball? Well, the best basketball player is LeBron James or whoever. But right. this is a weird business where you could know a LeBron James who never made it to the NBA totally. and is not even on a EuroLeague team, right? <laughs> right, now. It's like right. Not playing in Not Mexico. even playing in China somewhere. Right, yeah. right. Which is impossible in most of those sports. Almost always, if you're that good, you're going to get seen. It's crazy that in this game it's so possible to not be seen because you, you, ha if you're that talented in, in sports and you're not found, you got to be isolated. You, you're probably a kid on an Island playing ball somewhere. Yeah. It's like an eighties movie where Kevin Bacon discovers you in right. Africa or right, something right, like right. that. That's the only way you'll be or, or, uh, found. or Nolte and Shaq. If you're right. blue chips, you're like right. this, uh, this anomaly from somewhere else. Right. But we all know in comedy, it's sort of like, you know, I always think about like Jimmy Kimmel is not the funniest human being I've met. And I, and I don't want people to think that's like he's top five. I'm just not saying, you know, right. people think it's euphemistically whatever or right. you're downgrade. Well, he's not that funny. No, he's super funny. Yeah. But the reason he has been able to have the career he's had is a combination of funny and then this workmanlike mentality, right. this just kind of pick up your lunch pail and show up every day and yeah. like never be late and prep, prepare and work like this crazy sort of work ethic meets the talent. Yeah. And I don't think people really factor in that ethic, you know, or the attitude. Totally. Well, also affable. He's so affable. Like. I think I think there's something about you could be super talented, but people want to know that people want to know you, and if they feel like they can know you, even if I'm, you're not a, you're not they're not really getting to know you, which Jimmy has a quality like that. If they feel like they know you, it's you're 
you're just more lovable for some reason, even if that's not the real case, right? Like there's plenty of people on TV or in comedy or film that like people think they know, but they don't at all. And then they find out about them and they're like, oh shit, I didn't know Army Hammer eats people. You know what I mean? Right. Like you think you, you don't really know these people, but if they're good at making you feel like you might know them, that in itself is a remarkable talent. I mean, it's manipulative, but it's also, it's really good. It's impressive. Well, and I don't know if he's manipulative people, if you're Ellen. <laughs> right, right. But if you're Jimmy, he's just being Jimmy. It's him, right, right. 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 So and it's I guess it's what they call it. You know what I mean? Like he's got it. Or yeah, whatever she's got whatever it, that bullshit is. Whatever that is. thing is. It's like they it it you know, at a certain point we're all just kind of animals and we either like people or we don't like people and there's something they exude or give off right. and we either respond to it or we don't. And you know it's good for show business. It's good for politics. It's good for it's good for everything, and it's good for picking up people at a bar. Right. You, you know what I mean? Like if you think about the trait of being at a bar and seeing a beautiful woman and going up and talking to her, the women. It's not like about how good looking you are or how tall you are. It's like, do they feel safe with you? Like, do right. they feel like so? You're saying to them, "Hey, let's get out of here." You know, and they're like, are you going to dismantle me <laughs> near the beach? Yeah. Or, or are gonna we going to have the okay. best night of our lives? Right. Like, So it's not really about like how good looking you are, or how tall you are. It's kind of like, what what's your vibe? Right. And if you're feeling uncomfortable in your own skin, it's, it's a non-starter. It's right? Yeah, that's so true. Well, it's also, uh, Neil Brennan and I were talking about that, about how like, with the new exposure of the internet, now people see so much more of you than they've ever seen. And really, it's so much vibe. Like, talent is such a high... It's it's such high currency uh, in our business, but also vibe. He was like, vibe is 90% of it at some point now on the internet. Because on the internet, that's all they can feel is your vibe. There's so many talented people that they can see every day thumbing through shit. Do you have the vibe that they can hold on to? And I thought that was interesting because it's like, yeah, man... I, you can be super. I know some super talented people, but they don't have a vibe that's anything other than talent or skill or you know just pure skill. And you're like, that's why they say when like you love sports, it's like there's athletes that I love that I'm like, oh, I think that guy's so good, but man, what a drip. You know, you're like, there's nothing to him. And it right. would it be an ascension otherwise? Because I have fr I had a friend that played pro baseball for four years, and I was and he was good. I mean, he was actually quite talented. He got traded New York, Boston, Tampa. Like he moved around. And I was like, what do you think it was? Like, why do you think, you know, this is years later. I was like, why do you think you capped out and it was over? He's like, I just, they didn't, they didn't like me. I was like, what, what? And he's like, I'm, I'm quiet. I'm introverted and I'm, I don't really, I don't, I didn't belong. And so I think that's just as much it as like his vibe was probably shit to them. They were like, this guy's not, he's not what we need in the program. So it's like, that is what I've learned in my career is like, where do you fit in the program? It's just like an acting in the Hollywood world. It's like. I know my talent level, but at the end of the day, they're like, oh, do they want to hang out with you? That's really, at some point, what it is. Do they want to fucking be near you all day for 12, 13 hours? Because yeah. you can be talented. If not, they're no, like, get I, out of here. Well, 100%, because like when I was, uh, when we would do the man show, you know, it's like every year we'd have to, you know, do we want that intern back? <laughs> right. Do we want that van driver back? Do right. we want that AP back? And it was always like, ah, guy's a douchebag. Like, right. I don't want to deal with that guy. Because the job is kind of the job. And most people don't have such an incredibly high skill level that they're irreplaceable. Right. Or, or, or so incompetent that you'll never hire them. Most people live in the middle. Yeah. And when you're in the middle in terms of competency in performing your task, then it just becomes like, I got to get in the van with this guy and we got to drive to LAX and do a bit. Right. That's 45 minutes. Do That's I really want to hang out no. with this guy? It's exhausting. Or I love this guy. Right. I right. mean, we, we'd had a guy, Adam De La Pena. We hired him as a writer or writer's assistant. He was my writer's assistant. And then, then he became a writer. But anyway, he showed up and we'd have guys show up to be like, right. We'd interview him, you know. And they just come into our office and they'd say, I went to Brown and I was work for the school newspaper and blah, blah, blah. This one guy, Adam De La Pena, shows up and he's wearing this super funky Hawaiian shirt. And it's cool, but it looks like a little different. And so me and Jimmy were like, where'd you get that Hawaiian shirt? And he's like, I made it. 
And we were like, you showed your own Hawaiian shirt? And he said, yes, I did. And we are like, wow. And he goes, hey, hire me. I'll show you one, too. And we're like, okay, <laughs> you're hired. You got the job. You kid. got a job. I'm going to read any of your shit, but you got the job. <laughs> it will save us time. Right. Well, you know the ingenuity of a guy who makes his own fucking Hawaiian shirt. I'm sure he can write a couple of jokes. Right. There's something in there. Right. So at the end of the day, it kind of becomes more about that. Yeah. In terms of the submissions, some guys writer submissions you read and it's like this shit is so killer i don't care how bad this guy is right. as, as far as the hang goes because yeah. we'd tape the man show and we're, when we're done on a friday night we'd go to the billiards place and order pitchers of beer and shoot pool and right. it's like you needed to kind of we have a softball game and stuff like you'd right. have to that have to be a decent hang yeah you know but some guys stuff would be so good that it wouldn't matter what their hang quotient was and then if you're so bad, you're not getting hired. But again, like most everyone falls in between Somewhere those in two. So make sure you're a good hang. Yeah, make sure you're make sure you're a good hang. That's probably the best advice. Is that and then you learn you learn it too, because you're like uh, you I've done enough stuff where you can tell why certain people keep working because of they're so good. They're that above level that you're like, oh, they're so good that they don't need, they can be kind of a dick or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's rare that I come across it, but once in a while you're like, oh yeah, they don't need to hang because they're somehow they've ascended above this shitty middle class that, you know, that we fall into that I'm somewhere in the middle of. Um, by the way, did you name your child after me? Is that, is that where this came from? We talked briefly about it and I didn't remember <laughs> it until now. Uh, Santino, uh, Sonny, always like the name Sonny. Um, is it Godfather of God? Is there a piece of the Godfather? I don't, y you know, probably. <laughs> yeah. So the thing with my twins is, um, I named my daughter Natalia because a million years ago when I was hosting Loveline, there was an actress named Natalia Saglutti and she was so beautiful. And I and and I remember just thinking Natalia, it's such a pretty name. Yeah. I just it stuck in my head in like from 1997 or something. Right. And she was so fetching. I was like, oh, I just had this positive imagery. So that was that. Uh, Sonny Santino was. Um, so I here's how dumb people are. You know, my last name is Carolla, uh, which it sounds pretty Italian because it is. Right. So my my. <laughs> family's Italian and I'm Italian but my stupid parents named me Adam and Adam doesn't fit with Italian heritage no, yeah, at no. all so they think I'm Jewish it's actually kind of funny because I work construction my entire adult life and no one ever mistook me for a Jew as soon as I got into comedy uh, like you're yeah, Jewish, Jewish you're, yeah. right and I'm like no yeah. I'm not Jewish and yeah. they're like but it's so funny that you stereotypes are true like oh, there's yeah. no Jew carpenters except for Jesus and there's nothing there was no Italian guys on the writing staff. But so Adam screwed everyone up. So they would go, Adam, and go, Adam Carolla. What's your heritage? What kind of name is that? And yeah. it was like Carolla. Like if my name was Tony Carolla, it fit. No, or Mario Carolla. Nobody, <laughs> Vince Carolla, Vinnie Carolla. Like no one ever got, my name was Vinnie Carolla. Everyone would go, hey, Paisan. Yeah, but they, right. Adam screwed everyone up. So yeah. I was like, if I ever have a kid, I'm just going to give him a nice Italian name and then it'll be Santino Carolla and then we'll know his hair. Then you'll know. Right. Well, I were, I I'm the I'm I am the other way like you. Andrew is a nothing. I mean, my mother's Irish, but Andrew isn't an Irish. You know what I mean? It's like there I'm so Irish it's, it's it's repulsive. I mean, we look like the map of Ireland and then my dad's side's all Italian and Santino, you know, it's such a strong Italian name. But it's usually a first name because it was my great grandfather's first name. Mm -hmm. Spoke such shit English that he didn't understand what surname was apparently. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know what my real last name is. I'm a first, I'm a last name first name guy. We don't know. I have no idea what it was, and I don't come from smart stock. So obviously this is just how I got assigned. But Andrew, when you know that that's the first cheap joke out of anybody's mouth is always like Santino. I thought it was gonna be a, you know. A big old Italian looking at us. Like, yeah, no, no, no. This is what happens when people have sex that come from, you know, yeah. when two people hate their father. This is from different neighborhoods. That's that's all this is. My, I, my real last name is Carollo. I think they just switch it to Carolla. Some... Yeah, why did they do that so much? And it's because it was it didn't really change much. My dad's brother Ralph 
always went by Corolla. Right. And my dad, Jim, went with Corolla. <laughs> I have what? no what? I have no goddamn idea what anyone was thinking. But that's why I always think that's a, like a, like when you get married too and you take the name and this whole name bullshit discussion. I'm always like at this point we should just names don't mean as much as we feel like they do. We're not exchanging land anymore. There's no right. dowries and shit. Right. You should just pick a name now. I feel like like when I got married, it's like, well, we should just be able to pick a new fun name. Granted, my last name was kind of nice, so I was like, I could keep it. But if you had sh two shit last names, you just pick new names. I feel like you just choose a new name for the child to be then of the new family. It's not like you're fighting for the shield, the crest of the right. Corollos any longer. And nobody nobody even knows anymore, like, whoever's real name is, is what, you know, especially in Hollywood. Like, you just become what you are. Yeah. Or... Or it doesn't work at all. But either way, who cares? Yeah, yeah it doesn't matter. Something good. Well, the amount of people that change their names too when they move, like that's that's become. I just feel like everyone has a quote unquote stage name, you know, and it and it's it's also like, well, I never understood the stage name unless your name was so hard to pronounce, you know. It was like Cuscagarian. Well, like, in in radio, they would always do it. All really, the, they would everybody. Uh, they do like the Saint Johns and the Saint Clairs and this <laughs> right. weird Saint stuff. Like, the, the, lots of people. Probably back in the day, there were more fake names in radio than than real names yeah. in radio. And what now, was the no purpose? Just catchiness and shit. I think it was kind of anonymity. I they didn't want to be hassled. They didn't want people like knowing where they lived or sure. finding out their information. And then also just sounding like something that flowed because you know you had to have um they would do it's actually kind of funny because they they would do like um they would do the jingles you know what i mean mm -hmm. and nobody wants to do it now back with harold sacralides <laughs> you know what i mean you'd rather have jamie st james right. you know what i mean like right. you'd, you'd have to hear what it sounded like when you got that little orchestra <laughs> singing it in the background yeah and, you know, uh, Brad Higginstaller or something didn't just roll <laughs> off the lips of the chicks right. from the junior college you hired to do the jingle. Coming back with Brad Higginstolenstein. Oh. <laughs> right. It just didn't, it didn't work didn't as good as, you know, Mary St. Clair. Right. Now, well, and now what's interesting to me is like now radio and and podcasting have kind of become this like synonymous universe where they can be kind of one and the same, especially like there's new apps that are popping up where they're trying to make the tie of making these almost one and the same because for a while radio has phased out. But now I feel like it, this is new radio anyway. It's just, it's just a different way to receive the medium. Yeah. I don't, it doesn't seem prudent to me to even define how you're hearing people. Right. You, know, you just want to hear who you want to hear sure. and sort of when you want to hear them. But it doesn't matter if it's a ra you know a terrestrial radio show that you download or a podcast that you download or you know there, there you know when I started out there was like a lot of talk about getting cars being enabled to have, you know, the internet and stuff like that yeah. and no one really knew that everyone's just gonna have everything they wanted on their phone right and then your car was just going to speak to your phone you know we <laughs> thought the f the car has to have it we we didn't really think in terms of the phone has to have it and then the car will hear it from the phone and right. then tell you that way so it's just the new world order is is i don't even know what stations my shows that I enjoy watching are on per se. Right. You know, there used to be like, like for instance, it doesn't really exist anymore, but when we were doing TV back in the day, a big deal was your lead in. Right. You know, who's, who was before who's you? Who's before you? And then, you know, your show would get shitty ratings and you go, well, that's because that shitty Tim Allen show's leading in. A, you know, <laughs> we got no lead in. You know, if we had Seinfeld leading us in, right. we do blah, blah, blah. blah. And it's a, just explaining to my kids that they should kind of listen to the show that comes on after the show they like because it's there. Right. 
because That's they're too lazy to get up and change the channel or whatever. <laughs> just just think about that notion of like, well, I'm going to listen to the song after the song I like or I'm going to watch the show. It doesn't exist. No. Everything is completely piecemeal. It's all a la carte now. Yeah, yeah. It's it a big buffet. Entertainment has become a big, huge buffet. Like you said, there's no... I don't know. A lot of things I've watched... I said this last night. We were watching something. I was like, what is that on? Is that on Netflix or on HBO? And she was like, I think it's Amazon. And I was like, yeah, who the, f at the fucking, it, at this point, it's wherever it is, it is. And I'll just, I'm going to just digest it, I guess. There's well, no, there's no, there's no affinity for any of these places but anymore. Anyway. Not only that, like I say to people like, is that on ESPN? It's on ESPN go. Right. Right. And like, let's go. <laughs> That's where you are with ESPN. Right, like, right. But regular ESPN? No, ESPN go, go plus. It's go plus. You have to be on ESPN go and, plus. And you have and to, like, you have to have the plus pro package. Otherwise you're not going to receive some of the other benefits. Yeah. Are you yeah. a member? And I'm like, <laughs> I just want to watch the show. Well, you can watch it on ESPN go. Right. Plus <laughs> premium premium. The premium, the platinum premium go plus app. But you if just you have, download the premium, just get the app. gold. Cause the gold is going to give you some of the same benefits as, as, as the premium. <laughs> But right. but if you get the intro level, that's free for the first. You can also can't if you're on AT and T. You know they'll just give it to you for free. That's how I feel about everything. Is now so I don't even I like I said again same thing. I go it's on what is it Amazon is that, is that our account or are we using our friend's account? I don't even know anymore. I think I've I think half of my shit is somebody else's shit. I I it, it's so. But on the other hand. I've always been like, look, I just want to come up with the ideas. I want to craft the bits. Yeah. I want to do the interviews. I want to say what I want to say. And like the other, whatever the technical, like, I don't care if I sound like Grandpa Corolla. I don't, I don't care. I just, I want to do the creative stuff. I want to do the content stuff the, as far as the distribution and what platform it's on. And, you know, have I checked my Facebook page today or whatever? I let the kids sure handle that. Well, when you say that, Grandpa Corolla, when you make that joke, do you, is there any fear of, of, of phasing out, of being like undercut by whatever the new shit is that's underneath you, or no? I don't really have... I, I didn't ever enter this with a lot of sort of pre-thoughts. Like, you know, people say, how did you know podcasting was going to work, you know, or whatever, 12 years ago. Right. I was like, I, I didn't know anything. I just wanted to talk, you know. I just right. sat down and wanted to talk, you know. And they go, but how, but you must have known this, or when did you know? Like, there's way too much talk about, like, when did you know? What did you know? Yeah. What did you think you would know? What what didn't you know? And I'm like, look, I just got into this to talk. And, and I'm completely blessed that I was able to, to make a living talking, I used to make a living swing a hammer, you know, yeah. and, and it, it was kind of funny. Something I'll always remember is I was at the Acme theater a million years ago. I built the Acme theater on, on Lancashire and NoHo in like 1991 or something. Well, you, you mean you physically built it? Yeah. Well, cause I was a carpenter, oh, so no we shit. needed to build the theater. Yeah, out, yeah. So they didn't have any money. So they went to the one dude. Yeah. They're like, please. It's some building. <laughs> We're broke experience. Yeah. I did a good job. It's still there. Still Adler theater. I think it is now, but my, my program director say, sounds like a radio thing. My theater director, Mark Sweeney, we were friends and I'd been doing Acme for like three years, you know, and I just said to him, like, what do you think? Am I, am I a writer? Am I a, a talent? Mm. Am I an actor? Like, what am I? Because this is 1993 at the time, you know, mm -hmm. and he's like, you just need a job where you just talk all day into a microphone. And I'm like, oh, thank you for inventing a non, like you need a job, you need right. a unicorn. Right, 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 <laughs> You right. need to impregnate women from the sky. Right. It's like, oh, thank you. I'm trying to get laid. Right. But where's your unicorn? Like I was like, he distilled me down to so, he invented podcasting in a weird way wow. in 1993. Like he's like, you just need a place you can go and just talk all day. Just vent about what's going on and what's right. happening and what you're thinking or what your take is. And I'm like, I get it, but there's at the time there's nothing but sitcoms sure. and and soap operas and you know comic books to right. to do, and so it always stuck in my head. I was like, "You're right, yeah, I know I'm right," and so it was this weird kind of fantasy job. 
and at some point it just became my reality. Like wow. th- what, what he was talking about doing in 19, you know, circa 92, 93 is exactly what we're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. He inv- so shout out to Mark Sweeney for, yes. for being the inventor of it all. Uh, well, shout out Mark Sweeney. I appreciate you coming, Adam. Um, I know you're on a tight schedule. And congrats on the 3,000th episode. I think that's incredible, man. Honestly. Oh, and I, I did want to say yeah because I I hate it when I don't compliment people. They don't need it's, to. It's authentic. I loved. I'm dying up here. Thanks, man. I I love. I you know people always say, what do you watch? What do you watch? What do you watch? It's like I watch Sports Center and TMZ and UFC or whatever. I don't yeah. have a lot of shows religiously watch that show oh thank you thought you you were great in it i i I, and i'm not gonna go like what happened to that show i've been a thousand shows what happened to the whatever (laughs) i don't know i don't even know what happened oh the business i mean it just do them and they're done but but it was great it was a great show and you were great thank you in it and uh i saw you do a set at the uh ice house a year and a quarter ago or whatever and i thought you're great oh thank you i wanted to Definitely make sure well, I, I, I got that it. out there before the mics went. Thank cold. you, thank you. They're gonna go. I'm gonna cut that off before we. We're Please. not putting that in. Uh, we end the show the same way. You look in the camera. You say one word or one phrase when I'm off camera to end the episode, uh, and it's gonna be it forever. So you say it when I'm off. Go ahead. Paradoxical. In here, we pour whiskey, 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 whiskey. whiskey. Oh, that creature in the ginger beard. Sturdy and ginger. Like vampires, the ginger gene is a curse. Gingers are beautiful. You owe me $5 for the whiskey and $75 for the horse. Gingers are hell no. This whiskey is excellent. Ginger. I like gingers.